In exercise 8, you'll be learning pure culture techniques. We're going to examine some of the organisms that routinely contaminate our food. During period 1 of the lab, you will learn how to perform a tea streak. You'll tea streak a mixed sample of bacteria for isolation. In that sample will be Escherichia coli and Staphylococcus epidermidis, and you will successfully separate them from one another. You'll also tea streak a provided food sample on differential and selective media in order to determine what presumptive microorganisms might be in that food sample. You'll become acquainted with different types of microbiological media. You'll prepare a gram stain of a provided food sample to predict the growth on these differential and selective media. And you'll prepare a serial dilution and plate count of a provided food sample. The tea streak is done to isolate bacteria from a mixed sample. The procedure is shown on the right, and I'll demonstrate this for you in lab. The plate is first divided into thirds using a Sharpie marker. You'll mark the base with the Sharpie, not the lid, in a T. A loop then is used for the procedure. The sample is acquired by dipping the loop into it, and then the loop uh, is spread onto the first area. You'll then sterilize the loop and streak some of area 1 into area 2. Sterilize your loop again and streak some of area 2 into area 3. If done properly, fewer and fewer organisms will fall off the loop in each area and result in isolated colonies after incubation. You will be tea streaking a mixture of Escherichia coli and Staphylococcus epidermidis an environmental sample of your choice, and various differential and selective media. Quick word on media. Media come to us in solid form, including slants, which are solidified on a slant board, which creates an area that we can inoculate. Deeps, which are inoculated in, I'm sorry, which are solidified in the upright position, so they don't have a, an area to inoculate. Usually these are inoculated by forcing the organism down into the medium with a needle. And then auger plates or petri dishes. Solid media typically are made with broths and powdered auger will be added to the broth at approximately a concentration of 1.5%. The liquid media are called broths and semi-solid media is actually solid media that has about 1% auger. Typically these media are used when we want to limit the amount of oxygen in the medium. We classify media in different categories. All purpose media supports the growth of a wide array of organisms. You've been using triptic soy auger throughout the semester. It's an all purpose medium. Nutrient auger is also an all purpose medium. Differential media allows differentiation between microorganisms based on biochemical differences of the organisms. In this lab, we'll be using EMB and MSA and McConkie. Sheep blood auger is considered a differential medium, and we'll be using that in an upcoming lab. Selective media is going to select for a certain type of organism. It promotes the growth of one type of organism while inhibiting others. The one we'll be using in this lab is called PEA. Finally, enrichment medium provides nutrients for a select group of organisms. It contains ingredients which inhibit unwanted growth and promotes the growth of the organism that we want to grow. For example, there's a medium called GN broth, that stands for gram-negative, that we use for stool. We'll isolate a stool, inoculate a stool specimen into the broth. This prolongs the lag phase of the normal fecal flora, such as E. coli, and allows fecal pathogens, like Salmonella and Shigella, to enter faster into the log phase of growth. So after 24 hours of incubation, where we might have had, at the beginning of incubation, a lot of E. coli and very few Salmonella, in this case now we'll have a lot of Salmonella and very few E. coli. We can then take a subculture from this broth and plate it onto different media in order to grow the Salmonella or Shigella. 
For the food sample in exercise aid, you're going to be using eosin methylene blue, or EMB auger. This is a very pretty purple medium. It is selective, selecting for gram-negative bacilli. The reason it selects for gram-negative bacilli is there are dyes called aniline dyes, eosin and methylene blue. And eosin and methylene blue will inhibit the growth of gram-positive organisms, but not affect the gram-negatives. This is also a differential medium and it differentiates bacteria based upon their ability to ferment lactose. Strong acid production by organisms such as E. coli from lactose fermentation will give us a metallic green sheen that you see on the right. A weaker fermentation of lactose results in colonies with a pinkish purple color. Organisms that cannot ferment lactose are going to remain colorless, actually the color of the medium. Clinical uses for uh, EMB auger. EMB auger typically would be used for specimens that we would think would have gram-negative pathogens in there, such as urine, feces, after enrichment of course, and wound cultures. Another medium that we're going to be using, which is a lot like EMB, is called McConkie auger. McConkie auger is selective. It has bile salts and crystal violet in it and the bile salts in crystal violet inhibit gram-positive organisms and let the gram-negatives flourish. It's differential. It has neutral red as a pH indicator, and its differentiating capacity is due to, again, lactose fermentation, just like EMB. When bacteria ferment lactose and produce enough acid to reduce the pH below 6.8, the neutral red turns from colorless to red. So a lactose positive organism is going to be pink or red. A lactose negative organism will be colorless. McConkie auger is used very much like EMB auger. We would use it for urine, for feces after enrichment, or for wound cultures. Mannitol salt auger is a selective medium. It contains sodium chloride, staphylococci, are called halophilic. They tolerate salt and are able to grow in this medium. This medium allows us then to grow staphylococci and then to differentiate them. There's mannitol in this medium which is a sugar. Staphylococcus aureus can ferment mannitol. Staphylococcus epidermidis cannot. Staphylococcus aureus will ferment mannitol to an acid end product. The pH indicator in this medium is phenol red. Phenol red will turn yellow in the presence of acid. So Staphylococcus aureus will give us a yellow colony. Staphylococcus epidermidis will give us a colorless or white colony. Clinical uses for mannitol salt would be any specimen that we suspect might harbor Staphylococcus aureus, such as a respiratory culture or a wound culture. We'll also be using phenylethyl alcohol auger, or PEA. PEA auger is only selective. It's used for the isolation of gram-positive organisms, specifically Staphylococcus and Streptococcus. On this plate, you can see the positive area has heavy growth, and this represents the gram-positive organism. The gram-negative organism, while it might grow slightly on this medium, it's going to grow very lightly. It will be inhibited and it is inhibited because the alcohol dissolves the outer membrane of the gram-negative organism. The clinical uses for PEA will be wound cultures and respiratory cultures. Again, any place that we might find Staphylococcus or Streptococcus. We'll also be using a medium called SS or Salmonella Shigella auger. This is a selective medium. It has bile salts and brilliant green and these two together are going to inhibit gram-positive organisms and allow gram-negatives to grow. It's also a differential medium. In this medium is sodium thiosulfate and ferric citrate. This allows us to detect the production of a gas called hydrogen sulfide. This is going to cause a black colony and this is what we see with salmonella. We also can see this with proteus. There's a pH indicator in this medium that's going to let us know whether or not the organism ferments lactose. The pH, media, pH indicator is called neutral red. Enteric organisms 
are lactose fermenters, so we are going to see pink colonies. E. coli and other enteric organisms found in the intestines are going to give us a pink colony. What we're looking for is either a colorless colony or one that turns black, which could indicate Salmonella or Shigella, both of which are serious pathogens. Clinical uses for this medium would be stool cultures. Oftentimes it's important to determine the exact number of bacteria in a specimen. For example, water supply companies are going to determine how many coliforms are in water. Perhaps you're familiar with Lake Erie and the coliform counts that they do there. They need to know how many coliforms are present to find out whether or not the water is safe to drink or the water is safe to swim in. Staphylococcus aureus in milk, for example. When cows are milked, the milk is batched. If a cow has mastitis, there's going to be Staphylococcus aureus in the milk. The number of Staphylococcus aureus cells in a sample of milk will be determined to see if that milk is safe to drink. We also enumerate the number of colonies in voided clean catch midstream urine. In fact, the last lab that we're together this semester, you'll be doing just that. Potential pathogens found in food. For example, if there is an outbreak of Shigella or Salmonella after a picnic, a sample of food will be taken and analyzed to see the exact number of pathogens in that sample. And that's done to determine if the infectious dose is probable. There may be salmonella, for example, in the food, but if there's such a small amount, it's unlikely that the infectious dose was reached and therefore someone would not have gotten sick. Sometimes knowing the exact number of microorganisms in a sample is totally irrelevant. For example, in sterile fluids, I don't care if there's one Staphylococcus aureus or if there are a hundred. Staphylococcus aureus shouldn't be in a sterile fluid. Nothing should be in a sterile fluid. It's sterile. Pathogens in a wound, for example, I don't care how many there are. Staphylococcus aureus doesn't belong in a wound. Streptococcus pyogenes doesn't belong in the throat. So if I find 50 or if I find 5,000, it makes no difference to me. Just the mere presence that it is there is significant. There are a number of ways that we can enumerate the number of bacteria in a sample. The first is the direct count. The direct count is a microscopic observation of a sample. We need a special slide to do this called a cytometer. This is only useful if the bacterial count is high. If there are very few organisms in the, in the drop that we are observing, we won't be able to see them. But if the count is high, we'll be able to count them on this grid that you see. Both dead and living organisms are going to be visible, so of course that is going to influence the count. We're just going to count the number of organisms and we really won't know if they're alive or dead. Modal organisms, of course, present a problem here because if they're swimming all over the place, it makes a count very difficult to achieve. Serial dilution and plate count is what we're going to be doing in lab. Serially diluting a liquid specimen and plating aliquots on an appropriate medium is how this is done. You can see on the top of this, this image that we have a serial dilution and on the bottom will be what the, dilution, uh, the dilutions look like after a plate count is done. The advantage to this is it enumerates only living organisms. Something that's dead won't grow on here. However, the organism has to be able to grow on the media that we choose. This is a time-consuming process, as you'll find out, and it's quite wasteful because we end up only counting one of these plates, and yet we may uh, create six of them or seven of them. Without adequate replication, the count can be inaccurate, and this carries a risk of, of not carrying the dilution far enough or choosing too steep of a dilution. You may miss the plate that you need to count. So if you make the sample too dilute, you'll miss it. If you, may, if you don't carry it out far enough, you'll miss the appropriate count. Here's how we do, uh, count, how we create dilutions. Dilutions are ratios. It's the number of parts of a sample to the number of parts of diluent. The diluent is the fluid that we use for diluting. Diluent can be water, it can be broth, it can be saline. The sample part is always calculated to one. 
So dilutions are always written as one to something. If we have one milliliter of sample and nine milliliters of diluent, we have one part sample, nine parts diluent, nine plus one is ten, one of which is the sample, this is a one to ten dilution. If we have a tenth of a milliliter of sample and nine tenths of a milliliter of diluent, I still have one part of sample and nine parts of diluent for a total of ten parts. This is still a one to ten dilution. Note that the sample is always calculated to one. If I have a half a milliliter of sample and a half a milliliter of diluent, I have one part sample, one part diluent, one plus one is two, so this is a one to two dilution. A serial dilution is done in a series of the same dilution. We'll be doing a tenfold dilution in lab. We'll be creating a series of one to ten dilutions, each one being made from the previous dilution. If we were to do this as a uh, one to two dilutions, we would call this a twofold serial dilution. So we'll be starting with one milliliter of sample, adding it to nine milliliters of water, which makes a one to ten dilution. We'll mix that, then add one milliliter from that one to ten into the next tube that has nine milliliters of water. We're making a one to ten of a one to ten, so this is a one to one hundred. We'll carry this out most likely to a one to one hundred thousand dilution. Once the dilutions are prepared, then we have to take a sample or an aliquot and dispense it onto an appropriate medium. We're going to be do using TSA. We use a tenth of a milliliter instead of a full milliliter because a full milliliter is too much. It puddles on the plate, the organism move, move around during incubation, and we don't get clear colonies forming to be able to count. The inoculum of one tenth of a milliliter is going to be spread all over the plate very thoroughly using a sterile bent glass rod. The media then is incubated in an inverted position for 24 hours. During period two, the first thing we're going to do is isolate the E. coli and Staphylococcus epidermidis that you T-streaked onto slants. If this was performed properly, you will see two different colonies on the TSA plate. The smaller white colony is going to be Staphylococcus epidermidis. The larger yellowish colony is going to be E. coli. Using a sterile inoculating needle, you are going to pick one isolated colony and transfer it to a TSA slant. We use a gentle zigzag motion to inoculate the auger up, up the slant, and then you'll repeat this with the other type of colony on the second slant. You'll incubate that until next week's lab. With your environmental sample, you're going to choose one colony and prepare something called a stroke slant. You're going to inoculate a slant with a straight line, not a zigzag, using a needle, and we call this a stroke slant. From that same colony on your environmental sample, inoculate a broth. You're going to incubate these 37 degrees and the environmental sample plate is going to be saved until exercise 9. You'll also be doing your plate count calculations. You'll lay all six plates in front of you and determine the plate that has between 30 and 300 colonies. Plates that have more than 300 colonies are called TNTC or too numerous to count. Plates that have fewer than 30 colonies are called TFTC, or too few to count. Using the tally register, count the number of colonies, or colony forming units as we call them, on the chosen plate. Then you'll calculate the CFU per milliliter. You'll do this by taking the number of colonies that you counted, multiplying it by the inverse of the dilution of the plate that you counted, and multiplying that by the inverse of the inoculum that you put on the plate. 
Let's say you counted 250 colonies on the, ten, on the 10 to the minus 4 dilution. Remember, your inoculum was 1 tenth of a milliliter. That was the amount that you put on the plate. Multiplying 250 times the inverse of 10 to the minus 4, which is 10 to the 4th, multiplied by the inverse of 0.1, which is 10. This equals 25 million. And writing this then in scientific notation, it is 2.5 times 10 to the 7th. Which plate of these would you choose to count? Did you say this one? If so, you were correct. You're also going to be observing the differential and selective media that you T-streaked from the food samples. First, you want to observe the gram stain of the food and predict which media should have growth. If you see gram-positive cocci, for example, in the food specimen, then you would expect to see growth on the PEA and the MSA. If you see gram-negative rods, you would expect to see growth on the SS, perhaps, also on the EMB and the McConkie. Record the possible identity of the organisms on the media, referring to the table in the lab manual. During period 3, you are going to gram stain the two slants that you inoculated during period 2. Remember, one should be yellow and one should have white growth. The white growth is going to be Staphylococcus epidermidis and the one with the yellowish growth is going to be Escherichia coli. Preparing the gram stain then, E. coli will stain as gram-negative rods, and Staphylococcus epidermidis will stain as gram-positive cocci. And if you didn't get your gram stain from the previous lab, you can earn your 10 points by showing these to me in this lab. See you in lab!